skill development and developer training, Entrepreneur Skill Development Commission. Mr. Akasana has been a part of the AP Skill Development Department from its initiation in 2014 and has been guiding thousands of students with some of the latest technologies that the industry needs. He has also conducted numerous training programs, workshops and hackathons for both engineering students and faculty on skills required to master cutting edge technologies like computational thinking, algorithm design techniques, web development using various scripting languages, system engineering and very recently mobile development developed mobile software solutions for various government departments like skill development, higher education in an attempt to promote mobile governance. He has also been working with Google USA for a con as a consultant on behalf of APSSDC for developer training. He was also a part of the core team that designed the Android Developer Fundamentals and Mobile Web Specialist course for the global audience. Mr. Akar Sinha worked along with the Google Global Certification Team in designing and curating with the certification for the role of, a, of, a, of an associate Android developer. He has also been working with the work product development team of Android Studio in transforming the distributed architecture of the product into a centralized architecture for maximum outreach. He was also selected as a part of the core strategic committee by Google for the Google India Initiative. Currently, he is working on introducing specialized web, mobile, cloud and data courses as fundamental courses for all computer science students in, a, in the state of Andhra Pradesh. Introducing the concept of mobile development clubs in college campuses and also introducing computational thinking and problem solving skills in collaboration with Wolfram Research for over 7,000 social welfare, tribal welfare and private schools. I now request our beloved Pro Vice Chancellor Geetam, Professor K. Shivarama Krishna sir, to facilitate our guest, Mr. Rata Sinha. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. students uh, attending this program. A very good morning to you all. Uh, I would like to first of all talk about the initiation, the, the way, I mean how the entire skill development initiative was started in Andhra Pradesh in uh, early 2014. So in an attempt to promote skill development, entrepreneurship and innovation in the state of Andhra Pradesh. The government has decided to uh, have a separate department, form a separate department which can take up uh, operations related to this uh, domain. And as part of this policy, the Department of Skill Development, Entrepreneurship and Innovation was formed and Andhra Pradesh State Skill Development Corporation has become the executing wing for the Department of Skill Development, Entrepreneurship and Innovation. So right from its uh, initiation, uh, we have mostly been focusing only on uh, skill development. Most of our operations have been only towards promoting skill development, making sure that you know wide range of skills are 
imparted to uh, people, not only from uh, the academic community, but also for, for people who are not part of uh, uh, any you know, formal education system. And very recently, I think just about a year ago, we have we are slowly changing our focus towards building uh, a robust entrepreneurship uh, you know, development policy, entrepreneurship development framework so that all the skilled manpower that we have in the state uh, will get a chance to explore uh, the domain of entrepreneurship as well. Uh, as of now, there is no formal framework that is there. Uh, this, at this scale, this particular initiative is the first of its kind. And we are, happy, we are very happy to, uh, uh, you know, let all of you know that you know, this is, this is being done at uh, state level. Uh, very few. I don't think there's any other state that is having uh, a similar kind of framework uh, in its uh, policy. Uh, the, the, the main purpose that I'm here is to bring in uh, a technology perspective to innovation and entrepreneurship uh, because I mostly work with uh, technology related training, certification, curriculum development uh, and also you know, placements and things like that. So I would like to just talk briefly about uh, this, how technology plays uh, a crucial role in entrepreneurship uh, and innovation. So. Basically, I mean, if you if you look at uh, technology, it's continuously changing. So we never know how what kind of changes to expect every year in the next. Technology will evolve, and how do we adapt or make our students, that is all of you, and the society to adapt to this kind of change? The other way of looking at this is to. You know, empower students, empower individuals to look into entrepreneurship, make use of technology, and build their own business models. Just so that as technology changes, though there might be a change in, in the business model, the business model will also evolve along with the technology. So, having a good business model uh, is one aspect. Also, having all the technology support that you can get to evolve and make sure that your model succeeds and is established uh, in the system is also equally important. You can have uh, ideas related to different domains like recently uh, agriculture is, is a primary focus in our state. Uh, Skill Development Corporation is also working with uh, the uh, a drone initiative wherein we are, uh, uh, we are having a separate unit established to manufacture drones, a separate unit to train uh, drone operators, and a separate application center, an application development center, wherein all the data that is captured with these drones uh, gets uh, analyzed, it, it gets passed, and then we come up with useful applications that can be built with this kind of data. So that is one major aspect and these are just uh, ideas that I would like to give all of you just so that you can take advantage of these operations, these initiatives that are happening and you can align your business model or your idea with uh, these domains. Uh, another important domain that, I mean, uh, with, I'm specifically focusing on drone, this drones initiative because all of you will definitely have uh, direct access to this once you get into uh, this kind of this particular framework. The other sector that we are uh, uh, very particularly interested in is the education sector. Uh, and as you all know, there are a lot of changes that are happening. And uh, one particular project that I am working on as of today is uh, building a personalized, uh, you know, education or educator. Uh, application you know which can customize itself based on the person or the candidate to which it is tutoring on a wide range of uh, you know, wide range of uh, topics and subjects 
So th this is another uh, important and useful uh, area for you to look into and make use of technology uh, in building a, a robust business model. Uh, the other thing, uh, the other sector that I would like to uh, talk about would be the manufacturing sector. Uh, Andhra Pradesh State Skill Development Corporation has established uh, Siemens Centers of Excellence uh, in uh, around 36 uh, uh, institutions in the state. Six of these have uh, centers of excellence and the others are uh, technical skill development institutions. And we have state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure available in these. Uh, you can name any particular uh, technology that is being used in the manufacturing sector and you'll find it in these centers. So this, this would also be a good opportunity for all of you to make use of this the this the, uh, this kind of infrastructure uh, in building your uh, business models. Uh, in addition to this, uh, Skill Development Corporation is also has also announced a wide range of certification, industry graded certifications, uh, in collaboration with multiple uh, industry partners. Uh, I am personally working with Google in uh, building the certification for uh, mobile development, web development, cloud development, as well as data engineering. And in addition to that, we have uh, tie-ups with Udacity. All of you must have heard of Udacity. So they have this nano degree program, which uh, is about, which is almost for like, uh, which has around 300 hours of effort from a student. And this nano degree applies to various domains. And the Skill Development Corporation is ready to provide uh, students access with access to the, these nano degrees at a very subsidized cost. Uh, around 50% of the cost will be uh, taken up by the government. All those students who have taken part in that uh, initiative will be given access to these nano degrees and certifications. So this is uh, a great opportunity for all of you. And uh, I hope all of you make use of this uh, to the maximum extent and see to it that your uh, you know, idea, business model uh, is, is established. So thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, hope all of you enjoy this event. Uh, I think it's still evening, evening 6 o'clock. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Krishna Preen Nandigadda, D. Amor Meccan School of Business, NU Center for Entrepreneurship Education, Member, Advisory Board, NU IDA Accelerator, is an accomplished business leader, successful serial entrepreneur, and an angel investor. He is a native of Gunto District, but has been living in Boston, USA for the past 27 years. His first startup was in Vijaywada nearly 32 years ago where he helped the local industry and small businesses automate their business processes and earned national recognition for his pioneering role in spreading computer culture in the then coastal Andhra Pradesh. His businesses in the United States were equally successful and was listed in the Inc. magazine's fastest growing private companies three years in a row. He helped the United States Department of Defense transform their HR processes using web technologies. As a member of the advisory board of Northeastern University Center for Entrepreneurship Education, he helps set the direction and strategy for the NU Idea Venture Accelerator. As an active member of Hyderabad Angels, Mr. Nandigadda invests in and mentors early stage businesses and entrepreneurs in India and the US. With this brief introduction, may I now request our beloved Pro Vice Chancellor Geetam, Professor K. Shivarama Krishna, to felicitate the guest of honor, Mr. Kri P. Krishna Nandigadda.
May I now request Mr. Krishna P. Nandagada to address the gathering. Good morning. <laughs> Dignitaries on the dais, uh, Professor Sri Ramakrishna, your Pro Vice Chancellor, my colleague and friend, uh, uh, Professor Greg Collier, and my business partner from APSSDC, Akash uh, Sinha, the principal of uh, your Institute of Management, Professor Sheila, and her team dear faculty and students. It's a great honor to be here uh, at Geetam. Even though I must tell you I have a personal connection to uh, uh, this city and, the, and this region. Uh, my father uh, was a product of Andhra University uh, back in the olden days. And uh, he taught at uh, a nearby Maharaja's College in Vijayanagaram. And even though I was not born there, I was raised the first few years, about eight or nine years of my early childhood, I spent in Vijayanagaram. In fact, uh, the name Krishna P. Nangegada, P stands for Paidi. Paidi, Paidi Thalli is a, Paidi Thalli is a goddess of uh, Vijayanagaram. That's where I get that name from. So I have a deep personal connection to this uh, region and I'm very happy to be to be back here. Uh, even though I have not visited the region for a number of years, I made a brief visit a couple of years ago actually. I spent a few minutes in your university about two years ago. Uh, but other than that, uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, I've, I've never visited this uh, region. So it's very, very happy and uh, uh, a great occasion to be to be back here in front of you. I started my entrepreneurial journey in Vijayawada about 32 years ago uh, when I uh, founded a company, a small uh, uh, computer consulting and uh, automation services company. Uh, I built that it's an extremely great run ahead. I, had, I, ran, I ran that company for about five years before moving to the US and continuing the, the entrepreneurial journey in, in the US. Uh, because once you become an entrepreneur, you can never cease to be an entrepreneur. So it's, it's, it's a bug that that bites you and it, it stays with you. It it, it will never go away. Uh, so I have, uh, for the past three and a half decades or so, I have uh, made the journey, uh, and I've built some companies in the in the U.S. Some very highly successful companies. Uh, uh, I have uh, made them global. Uh, I've, I've run operations. Uh, both in the U.S. Uh, and in India, uh, combined operations. Uh, then uh, lately, for the past four years or so, I've been associated with uh, Northeastern University. Uh, actually, I had attended Northeastern University to do my MBAs. Most of you uh, must be pursuing your MBAs. Uh, but unfortunately, I never finished my MBA. Uh, so I keep uh, teasing Professor Collier that uh, uh, they should really give me a degree, even though I never uh, finished formal education. Uh, I really would like to go back and attend classes and take uh, a degree in uh, in management, uh, but I don't have. An, I only have a degree in uh, engineering. So maybe one day I will I will get that degree, and uh, maybe one day Professor Collier and his uh, uh, his uh, colleagues uh, will give me that degree. Uh, so I've been associated with them uh, as an advisor. Uh, they have a great uh, entrepreneurship uh, education, a center for entrepreneurship uh, education. Uh, and they have, within that center, they have uh, uh, an accelerator, a venture accelerator. They call it Idea Accelerator. So I've become a member of uh, Because when I went back, I had attended the college in the 90s. Uh, uh, when I went back uh, to check on the college uh, about four or five years ago, uh, it had transformed itself uh, so much. It was a, a sleepy little college uh, about 20, 25 years ago, but now it's uh, buzzing with a lot of activity. There's a lot of entrepreneurship uh, activity going on on campus uh, within the center. So I thought it's a good time for me to go get re-engaged with the center. So when I, when I called and talked to them, they invited me to be uh, on their uh, board of advisors. Uh, 
So in the last four years, I have watched their activities so closely, and I've been uh, associated with uh, a number of ventures there. Uh, they have about 350 ventures in that accelerator now, uh, one of the largest, uh, single largest concentration of ventures uh, anywhere uh, in the U.S. And uh, they apply uh, a, a very unique methodology in, um, in taking these ventures forward, these venture ideas, into becoming uh, full, fully developed uh, commercial uh, ventures right into the uh, real world. As uh, Professor Sivaram Krishna mentioned uh, earlier in his uh, address, you can be trained to be an entrepreneur. Uh, it doesn't mean that an entrepreneur has to be born. There are some good naturally born entrepreneurs, no doubt. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, the, the second or third generation of entrepreneurs uh, uh, that uh, you know, have uh, the gene of entrepreneurship in them, to, so to speak. Uh, uh, you, you have in the family, the Tata's family, if you look at uh, uh, Mr. Jamshedji Tata, the, the pioneer of entrepreneurship in, uh, in India, he, uh, and then the JRD Tata subsequently came out, and then Mr. Ratan Tata. So there, there are a few examples, uh, uh, but it's something that can be trained. If you have uh, the basic interest in, in uh, in developing a venture, there is help available. And that's what Northeastern University has been doing. So you come up with an idea, uh, they know how to help you move that idea forward and c converting that into, into a venture. So having worked with the, uh, Northeastern University and their idea accelerator for a, a few years, then I thought there's something that uh, we could use here in Andhra Pradesh. Right at that time, uh, the state uh, had undergone uh, a bifurcation, and uh, we now have uh, an Andhra Pradesh. Uh, I think we just retained the name and nothing else uh, in, in the bifurcation. Uh, so we needed a lot of resources. We needed uh, a, a new beginning, uh, so to speak. So uh, I thought this was a good opportunity for us to bring Northeastern University to, to Andhra Pradesh. So I worked on both sides. Uh, it took me some time to convince uh, Northeastern University that this is a good thing uh, to do, uh, to enter India. They had never uh, been to India before. And uh, obviously working with the government uh, to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to persuade them to consider this program uh, to be offered to uh, the students of Andhra Pradesh. So finally, it took about two years of uh, uh, talking back and forth, but finally they both agreed to come together and sign uh, an MOU. Uh, this MOU was signed about six months ago, and since then, in the last four months, uh, then I've decided, I made a personal commitment that uh, if uh, an MOU gets signed uh, between the two entities and uh, we expect that things will roll and happen, uh, it, won't, uh, it won't work that way, especially in India, it doesn't work that way. So I, I made a personal commitment that I would move here, move back from Boston to, to Andhra Pradesh and uh, help roll out this program, uh, because what is successful in Boston may not really work always in, in India. There are a few elements where you have to localize a few things, fine tune the, the program to the local needs. So that is uh, needed, that, that can be accomplished only if you're here personally uh, and talking with both sides of, uh, uh, of the equation. So that's the role I'm playing now in forming uh, the uh, Institute, International Institute of Entrepreneurship Development, I2E, under the umbrella of uh, APSSDC. I work with Northeastern University, I work with uh, APSSDC and pull together the resources and help build the team to take this forward. And the last four months uh, uh, have been extremely encouraging. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, been able to uh, spread our message uh, to all the 13 districts of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, uh, not only that, uh, we've also reached out to uh, the four neighboring states, uh, uh, southern states of India. Uh, we had interest from uh, Telangana, we had participation from uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and even uh, Kerala. So the, the word is spreading. I think the entrepreneurship zeal uh, is there, uh, inherent in, uh, in, in uh, most people, uh, and it is uh, it's time for us. I think we have a great opportunity here uh, 
uh, India is on the verge of becoming a world world power uh, economically and otherwise. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, a very fast growing economy uh, in India. Uh, we have uh, the youth. Uh, we have the largest concentration of millennials uh, in India. We have we have 400 million uh, young people in India, uh, which is you know, mind boggling because. Uh, uh, I put that number in context. Uh, uh, in the U.S., there are 40 million, uh, 40 million millennials. So we have 10 times more millennials uh, in in uh, India. That's that's a great opportunity because the productivity. When I say millennials, the next 30 or 40 years, you're going to be productive. Whereas uh, in the advanced countries like uh, the U.S. or Germany or Japan, uh, it, we are faced with the aging population. The population is aging. When the population ages. Uh, uh, it it draws on the resources. It doesn't contribute to the productivity of uh, the economy. Whereas uh, in your uh, at your age, you contribute to the productivity. So that's a big difference uh, in the in the world world stage. So you have a great opportunity here, and we have uh, at I2E we have uh, the resources. And Northeastern University participates in this program. Uh, they are very hands on in the program. Professor Collier. Uh, is already making his second visit uh, to India in the last four months. We had another colleague uh, visit us last month. So they're here on a regular basis. They're very, very interested uh, in uh, making sure that this program uh, uh, is, is very successfully implemented. And I'm here personally to make sure that that happens. So with that, uh, I would uh, like to encourage you to consider entrepreneurship as uh, a career choice. Uh, it, it is something that you can choose to be an entrepreneur. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to start up a business to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you, you can learn the skills of entrepreneurship and use them wherever you go to work. You may go work for a large corporation and you can use the same skills in a large corporation as well. Uh, uh, so with that, uh, I would like to conclude my address uh, with uh, all best wishes to you. You will see me in a, in a short while. Uh, I will take you through a formal presentation of the activities that uh, are going on in, uh, in I2E. But until then, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's great to be here. Thank you, sir, for your valuable speech. Now, I request Ms. Pranita Patnayak to introduce the keynote speaker of the day, Professor Gregory Collier. Dia Moore, McKim School of Business, Director, International Programs, NUCEE, Professor, Entrepreneurship and Innovation. As a top-rated professor at Northeastern University, Collier's focus is on corporate innovation, business model innovation, and corporate and entrepreneurial sales strategy. As the Director of International Programs, he works with governments to help develop entrepreneurial ecosystem policy and growth strategies. He is the former assistant dean of executive programs and lecturer in strategy and innovation at the Boston University Questrom School of Business. Before entering academia in 2008, he had a successful career in leading strategic growth with firms such as Fidelity Investments, Electronic Data Systems, and General Motors. Collier earned his MBA at Eastern Michigan University and an undergraduate degree in computer science and electrical engineering from Purdue University. He also received a degree in international business from Thunderbird University. Among his accomplishments between 1989 and 2000, he launched and developed EDS's manufacturing practice in the Asia Pacific region. He was also responsible for significant growth initiatives with Fidelity Capital Management. Collier left the corporate arena to start several successful entrepreneurial ventures. With his brief introduction, I now request our beloved Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor K. Shivram Krishna, to felicitate Professor Gregory Collier.
hopefully we'll get a little bit more lively as the day wears on. Um, I'm not so formal, uh, but it's my honor to be here. I, I'm grateful for uh, Pro Vice Chancellor here, Geetham, Geetham University, APSSDC, who has been a great partner with us for the last uh, several months, probably six to seven months, my good friend Krish Nagdigana, uh, who uh, keeps berating me. He, he's going to get that MBA one way or the other. Um, <laughs> It's, it's my honor to be here. I've had a really uh, enjoyable uh, time. This week has been great. The weather has been fabulous. I was here in August. Uh, the last time I was visiting, uh, it was a little bit warmer. Um, I got uh, typhoid fever, so it was uh, a memorable visit, memorable visit. Um, one, of, one of the things that I do is I wander around this world and I get a chance to meet with students like you, which is probably the most exciting thing that someone like me gets a chance to do at the end of his career where you know, you start to wonder what it is we might be leaving behind and, and we don't really leave anything behind, we just get a chance to see what's coming up and so that's really my honor when I get a chance to talk to students like you and experience what you guys are, are doing and the things that you're approaching. If I was your age, I could not compete with you. It's, it's also interesting to note as I travel around the world, and we've done programs like this in, 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 in India, it's a, a bit unique. We have lots of, uh, um, I think, great things that we're learning as we uh, see what's happening here in the state of Andhra Pradesh and how we can apply what we're learning to uh, schools and universities and governments around the world. Um, we're learning from each other uh, in this great game, and I'll call it a great sport of entrepreneurship. Um, and, and at Northeastern University, this is indeed a sport. We don't have a football team or your football or our football. Um, we, don't, we don't have many sports, but if you go to our campus and you go to the coffee shops and you sit in the libraries and you go to the classrooms, the one topic that everyone talks about is not Tom Brady. <laughs> Thank you. It's entrepreneurship. And as we've seen, entrepreneurship requires a team. It's not an individual that can do it anymore, and I'll touch on that a little bit later uh, this morning. But uh, um, it's the kind of energy that can drive the world. And this is what I'm hoping for. One of the things that I'm looking for as I talk to uh, Japan and China and Korea and countries in Asia, I, I've spent, I spent 11 years here uh, working and, and working closely with with uh, countries and governments and businesses around uh, this region. I'm working in Germany. Believe it or not, they have entrepreneurship issues just as well. Um, Norway, same problems. And so we can solve all these problems kind of in the same way and the more that we start to connect across the globe with the ideas and the energy that we have, uh, we'll start to see amazing changes that benefit the entire world. Uh, I'm not an American first kind of guy. No one laughed. We don't, we don't follow U.S. politics, okay. <laughs> Which is probably a good idea, so uh, we'll just leave that there. Um, but it's, it, it really is exciting to see, and I think we'll, we'll start to uh, envision, in my mind, uh, you know, uh, how many have heard of Northeastern University? And I, I think I'm going to be quick because I'm in between U and T, so I won't, I won't keep the tea break from you, but how many have heard of Northeastern University? Well, uh, you're either lying or you're a very informed audience. Uh, we, are, we are not well known, but we are the fourth rated entrepreneurship school in the US. Um, and uh, most of you know Boston, right? <laughs> yeah, Boston. All right, so Boston is also a really interesting little city. Do you know San Francisco? Boston, San Francisco, leader in entrepreneurship and innovation. San Francisco? Boston? Boston has passed. San Francisco is the most active incubator and innovator in the, in the U.S. So Silicon Valley, eat our dust. So there's a lot of energy going on in Boston. And my objective and the reason I'm doing this kind of work here in Andhra Pradesh is to turn Andhra Pradesh and I pick a city, whether it's Vijayawada, I don't, it doesn't matter where we are. I want Andhra Pradesh to be the innovation center, not only of India, but the world. And this is why we're here. 
So hopefully through the afternoon, you'll, you'll get to hear me a lot. I apologize for that. Um, we'll have a few acti well, activities. Well, uh, activities, I didn't know how many there were going to be. I knew there were going to be a lot of you. And trying to do teamwork activities with a lot of people can be a bit of a challenge. So I'll have you do some exercises, thinking exercises, and some mental gymnastics uh, while I'm chatting uh, during the day. So hopefully you've come here with an idea Hopefully, maybe you're here with a team of people who you'd like to start a venture with, uh, or you're in the very early stages, and uh, I'll have you start to think about some of the things that you might be, uh, might help you generate this venture in a more uh, specific way, and hopefully one that might be more successful. So thank you very much for having me. I look forward to chatting with you later. Um, and uh, I think we're at a tea break, is that correct? So I, I, I love sending people off to, to get food. That's my passion. So, all right, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable speech. Now I request our distinguished guest, Mr. Krishna P. Nangigeda, to take up the session. Glad you joined now. Uh, we have uh, uh, a very interesting session coming up uh, from Professor Collier. But before uh, we bring him on stage, uh, I want to provide uh, a, a general introduction to I2E, uh, the International Institute of Entrepreneurship Development, and our activities, how ITE has come about, and uh, what we do at ITE. That's the type of uh, introduction I want, to, I want to give you. Then we'll bring uh, Professor Collier on stage, and he will uh, engage uh, uh, you in the workshop for the rest of the day. Um, it looks a little wacky on the screen. Uh, it didn't look this way when I put the presentation together, but I hope you can read everything there. Uh, so how many uh, of you are members of faculty here? Good number. Okay, the rest are students, obviously. How many from uh, uh, outside of uh, Geetam? Okay, they've monopolized this area. Uh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to uh, come over to Geetam uh, to, uh, to attend the session. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Uh, how many of you management students? Most everyone is a management student. What I meant is, you know, everybody is a student of management. That's not what I meant. What I meant, well, how many of you are studying for your MBA or a BBA degree, that's what I meant. I know, I know that's how you understood it. Okay, so the engineers are in a minority. Let's raise our hands, engineers. Okay, <laughs> that's a good, good number. <laughs> good number, good number. Very good, very good. Let's, uh, let's get started. We're running behind uh, by a few minutes, about 15 or 20 minutes, but we'll, we'll make up for that uh, soon. Uh, what I would like to do is flip through some of these uh, slides. What is I2E? Uh, it's uh, a partnership between Northeastern University and Andhra Pradesh State Skill Development Corporation. Within Northeastern University, we have uh, uh, different schools and colleges in the campus. There is a Dimore McKim School of Business. That is uh, where we have a partnership. Uh, uh, that's uh, where the management uh, and entrepreneurship uh, courses are taught in, uh, in the school. So this is a, a, a reminder that this is not a one-time knowledge transfer that Northeastern University has made to APSSDC and uh, they have backed off. It is an ongoing partnership. It's, uh, it's they're very hands-on. Northeastern University works with APSSDC and I2E on a, on a regular basis. Actually, sometimes we talk on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, professors from the university visit us regularly. It's been four months since we started this. And Professor Collier is already making a second visit. And uh, there is uh, another executive, uh, uh, Greg Dalmole. He was here last, uh, last month. And uh, Professor Collier will, will come back uh, in a month or two again. So that's how involved they are with, with the operation, with the, uh, with the initiative that APSSTC has started. So we are delivering 
the program through venture development centers. So we have uh, VDCs. We have four VDCs uh, right now, uh, and we are in the process of selecting a fifth one. But all five VDCs are in the Amravati capital region. That's where we're starting. We want to, everything good has to start somewhere. We've picked Amravati region to start the VDCs. Excuse me. Then the future centers uh, are being planned for two other clusters. There are going to be three clusters in the end. Uh, the first cluster in Amravati and the subsequent, subsequent clusters in Vizag and Tirupati we are planning. Eventually when it is all said and done, we will have 15 venture, give or take, about approximately 15 venture development centers uh, covering the entire uh, geography of uh, Andhra Pradesh. And that is obviously the mission of uh, I2E to empower entrepreneurs to develop and launch successful ventures. That is the goal that we are pursuing at I2E. So I have to uh, tell you, you, you look at the logo, I2E, it is in, in the corner here, and you, it is there throughout the presentation. I2E is uh, an abbreviated form for International Institute of Entrepreneurship Development, but there is also an inner meaning to that. I2E stands for an individual to an entrepreneur. And so it's a journey of an individual to becoming an entrepreneur. Or a small idea, a small letter, small idea becoming a large enterprise. And that's what we do. We help, I2E stands for that. We, it's an entrepreneurial journey, and this is your journey, and we are here to take you from a, an individual with a small idea to an entrepreneur to uh, launching and running a large enterprise. So that's the inner meaning of I2E. Just a, just a pictorial representation of uh, I2E. Can everyone see the screen here? Is that visible to the corners? I'm not obstructing the view, hopefully. So you have, uh, so the way the program runs is there are two components to the program. Uh, one is uh, learning through video instruction, video modules. There are a number of online video modules that you, you, you go through them. The, each module introduces you to a, to a concept to a business concept, if you take a topic of business models, there is a, a video, there is a collection of videos that give you the concepts. But once you have the concepts, you have the theory, you need to practice that. It, uh, then we give you some templates, some exercises to go do field work. So you do field work, talk to customers, talk to uh, partners, talk to whoever you have to talk to, then come back and compile and complete your exercise, turn that in uh, to the system then it will get peer reviewed. Some of your colleagues will uh, review it as well as reviewed by the, the coaches and then you will move on to the next modules. So it starts with someone having a business idea and then applying the various learnings through the video modules to the business idea by performing field work and then moving your venture idea through the process. That's, that's what it is at a, at a high level. To support that, we have uh, uh, several ecosystem elements. You, we have entrepreneurs clubs, uh, mentor networks, investor networks, and uh, other activities, the gap funding and other uh, seed funding activities going on to move the venture through the process. And uh, uh, a word or two about Northeastern University, it's a 120 year old university based in based in Boston. It, uh, uh, as, as Professor Collier said earlier, it's been a sleepy, a rather sleepy university for all of these years, but lately for the past about seven or eight years, uh, it has shot uh, itself into limelight through its entrepreneurship center. So the activities that are being done at the entrepreneurship center has uh, brought so much of visibility uh, to the university uh, the rankings of the university have jumped significantly 
during these seven or eight years. So we are uh, ranked about you know, 40 or so in the university rankings, but uh, on the top 100, we are one of the fastest, are, are the fastest growing uh, ranks wise uh, in the top 100 universities. All that because of entrepreneurship uh, education that uh, the university gives. And uh, we have uh, about nine colleges within the university. Those are the colleges, uh, just like how you have in Geetham, you have a number of colleges. And it's about the same size as Geetham. Uh, I was uh, in listening to your pro vice chancellor. Uh, you're about 22,000 students, uh, of, of course, across, I think, three campuses. Uh, uh, Northeastern University is about 20,000 uh, students, uh, most of them in one campus, or majority of them in one. one. Given it a serious thought, but no, you, you came up with this idea that uh, this is something that can be developed into, into, a, into a business. So we take you in, we put you through three steps to get into the next stage. What happens in the ready stage is you come in, you make a value proposition pitch. So value pro this is the business I'm trying to build, and this is the market I'm trying to build it for, and this is the team I'm going to build it with. So that, that's how, it's a very broad, high-level statement. Then we, we ask you, 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 we take that in, and we ask you to do customer, uh, sorry, you, you, first a market analysis. So this, the target market you're talking about, maybe it's too broad, narrow it down to a niche market. So what is it that, what is the demographic you want to, you want to address, or what is the, what is the geography that you want to address, or what is the combination of geography and demographic that you want to address. So narrow it down, make it into a, a target addressable market. This is your addressable market. Then in that market, we want you to conduct customer service. You would do, go talk to customers. Because the most important thing, the very most important thing, there's a misnomer among most of the students, is that if you have a product or a service, uh, you need money to start a business. How many of you think that you need money to start a business? No, you don't need money to start a business. Right? What's this? That's a stupid statement, right? So what you need initially, you need money, but not now, not to start a business. Uh, you need money later, and money is available. You don't need to put in your own money. Money is available. There's so many people willing to put money. I'm an angel investor. I sit on a group uh, to invest in businesses, and we are, we are itching to invest in good businesses. We don't get as many good businesses in front of us so that we can write a check into those businesses. What is most important is customer validation of your business idea. That is the single most important thing. And whenever you want to develop a business, is that business, is that idea that you're, is that product or service that you're offering, is that something a customer wants? Is that something that the customer will take from you and give you money in return? Right? The customer will take whatever you, you give them if, it, if, you give, if you give it for free. But is, does a customer want to make you, make you whole, give, give, give you money in return for the service or product. So that is the most important thing that you need to establish, that the product or service is something that the customer wants. That you accomplish through identifying the target market and then doing your customer service. So whatever business idea you start with, through these two exercises, market analysis and customer service, may undergo a drastic change. By the, by the time you complete these two exercises, the business idea, the, the type of business that you want to start may have undergone a phenomenal change. So which is okay, you should accept that. So that's something that you have to be prepared for. You have to be very flexible. You have to be open to feedback. You're open, open to customer input. Because if the customer doesn't want it, or you can't push it on the customer. So this, this is, you know, remember, this is the most important thing. So once you have refined your business idea based on your uh, market input and the customer uh, uh, feedback, then you would prepare a solution design. So this is how this how my business is going to look like. This is target market, and this is uh, what the what the what it does. And this is a solution now I'm providing. 
this is, this is a business solution I want to go with based on the market input. So if you make that pitch at this stage uh, to a committee, say that no, this is what I'm, I want to develop. So you made a pitch when you entered the stage, you made a pitch that this is the business I want to build. No customer input or, or no market analysis done or very little done. Now through the process, you have established that this is something that the customer will buy. So if you make that pitch, and if it's acceptable to the committee, then you move into the next stage, which is the set stage. In set stage, the focus is more on, now I have the idea, the customer is, there's a customer group, there's a target customer that I can sell this to, and I know how to build this business. Now how do you, how do you go about how much revenue will get, you will get? How are you going to market this? How are you going to distribute it? How are you, if this product is now made, are you going to sell it on the web? Are you going to sell it door to door? Are you going to appoint uh, dealers to uh, sell this to? Are you going to sell it through a retail chain of uh, stores? These are the decisions you have to make during the set stage. And what's the business model that you're going to follow? You'll get into more of the business model, model uh, uh, discussion later on. And the financial projections that you, you would make. So what, what are those things? Then you would end up with a business model. So through the, through the set stage, you are evolving, you're perfecting a business model. So at the end of the set stage, you have a business model that you want to pitch to a committee again. So if you are successful in convincing the committee that this is a, a viable business model, then you would move to the next stage. Then in the next stage, the go stage is all about raising money. How do you, now you have a viable, business idea that the customer is willing to pay for and you have done your projections, you have perfected your business model and now you need money to go forward with that business. So during this stage, the go stage, we will coach you on how to make an investor pitch. What is it that an investor looks for? If I'm the investor, I, I'm actually an investor in several companies, uh, what type of things that I look for when you make a pitch to me? So we coach you on that, then you go make those pitches and raise money for your business. So to answer, to go back to the question again, you don't need a lot of money to start a business. You need a little bit of money to start a business. Sometimes you need some money to do a, a survey or a market analysis or a sample uh, marketing. So these are things that you need some uh, money for or, or building a prototype. But after, beyond that, the big money you need in the go stage. And it may take several months, uh, if not a year or a year and a half, sometimes two years to get to the go stage itself. So you, it has to be a rigorous process through which you've tested your product. It's not that you've, you have an idea and you launch a business next month. You have to go through the process. That's what we, we teach. That's what we, we put you through. So at Northeastern University, we have over 350 ventures going through this process, ready, set, go, they're different, at different stages of that process. I would like to guess about 250 of them are in the ready stage itself. It's not easy to go past the ready stage because you know, we won't let you go into the next stage unless the foundation is rock solid. So we, we put that rigor into that and put you through a lot of, lot of trouble, so to speak, to, to go into, because if you try to build something on a weak foundation, you may, the chances of, uh, the probability of success uh, get diminished. So we want you to be strong there. Okay, so a, a, a word about gap fund. So we talked about the little, little money that you need through the process. Even that money is available through what we call a gap fund. At Northeastern University, We've created a gap fund. Uh, we give away about $250,000 a year to, uh, uh, to ventures, to students like you when you come, of course, Northeastern University students, when they build their business idea, they need this little, little money. We give $10,000 at a time uh, to these businesses, but they have to, it's not free money. It, it, the money is free, but it does, it's not given out freely. You have to compete for that money. You have to, uh, the 350 ventures are competing for that money. Uh, we give away uh, on a quarter, uh, every, we meet every uh, other month 
and I'm on that committee to, that gives out uh, money. Uh, there are about four ventures that come to us for money. Sometimes we have given money to all four, sometimes they've given to none. So it's a very competitive process. Uh, there are uh, you know, tough nuts like me sitting on the committee. Uh, we, we evaluate every aspect, we have evaluate uh, the success, how thoroughly have you done your work, all of your surveys, customer uh, surveys, market analysis before we give any money to you. So, so money that has to be competitively won, but the, this good amount of money, $10,000 uh, uh, each time you can apply three times, up to $30,000 you can get from uh, the college, it's a grant, it's money that's given away. We're trying to replicate something like that here in India also. You will have a gap fund pool that will be created uh, that may, in India we may not give it away for free. We may take a little bit of uh, equity stake in the, in the business. We still don't know what form or shape that will take, but bottom line, that gap fund will be available when you're ready to uh, ask, for that, ask for that money. So that is the, that's part of the, part of the deal, APSSDC or AP government with the help of uh, the universities, the venture development centers, and with some private partnership, we'll make that pool of money available for, for the gap fund. Uh, a few success stories coming out of uh, Northeastern University. The, there, as I mentioned, there are 350 ventures. It's been going on for about seven years now. Uh, we have, by now, 350. At any time, we, are, we have about 300 ventures. Some come in, some drop out, some uh, launch, some progress. So it's a continuous process that uh, goes on. But 46 ventures have been launched in the last seven years. It has taken seven years to launch 46 ventures. So don't assume that every single venture that gets started will automatically be launched. So the 46 ventures that uh, got launched, uh, we define launch as an event where either you ha your venture has sustainable revenues that it can survive on its own, or you have uh, raised at least $100,000 of external funding from investors like me, like uh, other angels. If you accomplished either one of these uh, uh, um, uh, events that you, you have been funded or you have uh, built enough revenue base for yourself, then we consider you launched. You don't need too much support from the center anymore. You can be on your own. So. 46 ventures have been launched and collectively they've raised uh, $80 million from external sources. So on average about $2 million uh, 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 a company. But some of them have raised more. Look at that Amino apps. They raised $27 million in venture capital. So one company that ventured $27 million. And the two, the top two names that you see there, uh, CloudLock is a cybersecurity company started by students like you, and their, their idea, the business is so good that Cisco acquired them and paid them close to $300 million. You know how much $300 million is? 2,000 crores, approximately. That's a, a little bit of pocket change, isn't it? Uh, so that is earned by students like you. And another business, uh, Silver Rail, uh, there's a travel application that was also sold to a travel company called Expedia. Have you heard about Expedia? Yes. So they bought them for almost another 2,000 crore rupees. I'm not saying that every single business will be bought for 2,000 crores, uh, but I think I'll be happy with uh, a, a one less zero or two less zeros, right? So. These are some of the highly successful businesses. They came, the point I'm trying to make is that these were ventures started by students just like you. And in, in interacting with so many students from almost all continents, uh, I can tell you, I'm sure uh, Professor Collier will endorse my statement here, that you are as smart, if not smarter than, as smart as, or if not smarter than, any other student in the world. So you don't have to think that you're inferior in some fashion. You, you are very smart. This generation is very, very smart. It's just that you need the opportunity, you need a little bit of coaching and guidance, and you can be as effective and as successful as any one of your counterparts anywhere on the globe. This is something that uh, I guarantee you. Well, what are we doing here in uh, India? 
through I2E, as I said, we established the, the International Institute of Entrepreneurship Development. We have structured this into three types of uh, uh, programs or courses. We had to call them courses because they're really not uh, a course, uh, you, know, you attend a lecture, take an exam, and get a grade. It, it's not that kind of a, a training that we, that we provide. Uh, the three programs that we offer uh, are uh, the very basic one is called Perspectives on Entrepreneurship. This is just a simple, lightweight online videos. You, you, you flip through videos, you learn a few fundamentals of entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? What does it take to be an entrepreneur? What, is, what type of leadership qualities you need? What type, how do you build teams in, in entrepreneurship? Some basics of uh, 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 sales and marketing. So those light, very light subjects. This, anybody can take. We are offering this to any student. Uh, we, we expect that every single person would be interested in entrepreneurship at some level or not. So that's something that's available, that, that's going to be available. We have not released it yet, but sometime this month you'll have that available. So your university will also get a chance to offer this to you. Uh, then we have uh, a slightly more uh, deeper certificate in Basics of Entrepreneurship, again, it's a three months part-time. We actually started this about uh, two, three months ago, and it's the first batch is uh, completing that program now, the Certificate in Basics of Entrepreneurship. The core, the most important thing is the Venture Development Diploma Program. That is what, uh, where the ready, set, go process, that's, that's the core of our, our program. That's where it's very serious. Now, the other two are lightweight, part-time. This requires developing a venture through the program. You have to start with a business idea and move it through the various stages to eventually launch. And this requires a full-time commitment. The reason you see part slash full-time is the commitment is serious commitment. The full, on a full-time basis, you have to commit. But you can do this on a part-time basis. You, you can you know, do your regular uh, coursework and also pursue this on the side, you need to create some space. So the, when we uh, appoint venture development centers, when we appoint colleges as venture development centers, one thing we ask them to do is uh, give you, uh, make this an open elective or give this some, integrate this program into your curriculum in some fashion that there's credits available, so which translates into time available for you to do. You're not being overburdened on top of your academics to also pursue this. Uh, but but I must remind you, in Northeastern University, we don't have that luxury. We, have, uh, we don't even have a structured program, uh, a course being available uh, where we give credits. This is completely voluntary. Students can walk into a center and sign up, say, I have a business idea, I need help. And they do this on top of everything else they do. They, they're pursuing their degrees, they're uh, pursuing their other activities, uh, they're probably into sports, uh, are doing so many other things, plus they're doing this. It's something like, you know, when you have passion for something, let's say you have passion for singing, or uh, you have passion for a sport, you will do that in addition to whatever else you're doing. Right? It's not that you'll stop your regular education and also only do singing. So it's something that you have to have a passion for and pursue it uh, on the side. So that's what we do in Northeastern University, but we, here we are trying to do it slightly differently, somewhat integrate into the curriculum so there is a, a time available for you to pursue it. We, we've gone through these uh, stages, the learning modules, we call them learning modules, we don't call them courses. Uh, the learning modules are the videos that are made available, but you will, the, the emphasis is on the field work that you do. Videos you can always you know, learn, you can always view the videos and learn the concepts. You're all smart, you'll get them very quickly. But uh, the emphasis is on, on doing this, uh, on doing the field work. So these are the stages and these are the modules that you would learn in each of these. I think we've already covered them. And then this one we covered, we, we're building an ecosystem uh, where you would get the help, prototyping and gap funding, legal accounting, mentor network, we're building a mentor network, we are drawing mentors from all fields of uh, 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 industry. Uh, these mentors are uh, successful entrepreneurs themselves. They would uh, guide you uh, 
they will have very limited time, but they will guide you through, through your uh, pursuit. And another thing that we are doing is forming entrepreneurs clubs, e-clubs, just like your other clubs that you have drama clubs and debating clubs. So you have uh, entrepreneurs clubs that are coming up. Uh, we are opening this up. You, you will get a communication. Your college will get a communication about it. And we want you to come forward. Uh, this is a student-driven club. The students form the club and they conduct the activities. So all of the activities that you see there, the speaker series, startup tours, all of those are organized by students like you. So that's something that will come to your campus also very soon. This is our value proposition to whoever signs up for the program. The diploma, in this case, is awarded by NU and APSSDC jointly. And the two most ready ventures get to travel to Boston, all expenses paid. From all of these ventures that we coach, the two most ready ventures will go to Boston to participate in the Global Husky Startup Challenge competition. The eligibility to get into the program, the VDDP, the diploma program is uh, currently we are only uh, allowing final or pre-final year students of BTEC, MBA, MCA, MTech, and any alumni who have already completed uh, this, the formal education and faculty and staff, it's open to faculty can be entrepreneurs, staff can be entrepreneurs. That's, how we, that's what we do in Northeastern University. Anyone who has an affiliation to Northeastern University, either as a student or, a, or, uh, or as a teacher or, uh, or a support staff, they can come and sign up. The, the resources are available to any one of them. So we are, in, we are encouraging faculty and staff also to come forward and, and take advantage of the program. The prerequisite to enter the program is obviously a coachable business idea. How do we get coachable business ideas? How do you know whether you have a business idea that's coachable? We've conducted a number of these. Have you seen these poster before? Some of you have. The, the idea uh, pitch and win contest. The last couple of months we've, we've been doing, doing these programs, the contest, but two, three of them we have done. And we have uh, received um, entries We've received a total of uh, close to 1,000 business ideas, 975 business ideas we've received from about 2,400 students all through the state. All 13 districts have participated in these. Some of you have, some of you participated in the idea contest? No? Well, okay, so I see one hand there. Some of your uh, fellow students might have participated because we have received um, participation from a number of uh, uh, Geetam, I don't remember if Geetam students participated, but uh, we did receive a number of entries from all of these Vijayanagaram, Vishakapatnam, Sikakulam, uh, Godavari districts from this belt we have received. Uh, uh, so these, these are a few that we've conducted and that's, those are the numbers I was talking about. We, we obviously gave away some prizes. We gave away about, gave away about 1.5 lakh rupees in prizes. Uh, but I think the more uh, important thing is we have qualified a number of these business ideas as, as coachable. And those are the ideas. Those are the students. These are the coachable ideas. These are 466 students, 318 ideas. So some, some ideas have more than one. So they were submitted in teams. So that's why you have the student's number uh, greater than uh, the ideas. So 466 students we've qualified and uh, those are the students that the program is available for. It's starting actually on Monday. There's a formal inauguration that is taking place. Uh, uh, hopefully the um, dignitaries from the highest levels of the government are expected to, to attend the event to launch the program on Monday in Vijayawada. Uh, and uh, the program uh, talked about e-clubs, you know, we would like you to be engaged with, uh, with the program, entrepreneurship uh, program through forming e-clubs, uh, through enrolling in the program that's starting on Monday. You could do uh, perspectives on entrepreneurship being launched uh, later this month. 
you can participate on the I2E, other I2E programs. We have a workshop today. We, we keep conducting these events. We have conducted in excess of 50 uh, events so far in the last four months, either a boot camp or a workshop or a seminar or info session. So some, all over the state, we are conducting these on a regular basis. So I'm sure your college will get in. We send invitations to all colleges. Uh, so make sure that you know you watch out for those invitations. Make we will make sure that they go into the right people in your campuses, and we would like you to participate and take advantage of uh, the knowledge that's being spread. And obviously, we want to encourage you to become entrepreneurs. Uh, if you're in a position of influencing others, you no, know, encourage others to become entrepreneurs uh, because entrepreneurship is something that uh, goes and stays with you. The, you. You get the knowledge; it stays with you. You may not start a business now, but it will be useful. Even if you go join uh, a company, it will be useful for you, as I mentioned in the morning. OK. I don't know if we're taking q and I'm happy to answer uh, questions. But uh, what we'll do is, in the interest of time, I'll uh, hand this over to Professor Collier now and uh, let him carry on with his um, workshop um, in terms of logistics. Uh, can we delay lunch a little bit? Is that OK? Or are you all hungry? No? You're not hungry? You'll skip lunch today? No, you won't skip lunch. But you can eat a slightly delayed lunch. So we'll give him about 45 minutes to an hour uh, at a logical time he'll, he'll break. Between 1.15 and 1.30, we'll, we'll, we'll break for lunch. So what uh, you? may want to do is, if you have questions, questions to me or to Professor Collier, uh, either from what we've talked to you or what he will be talking to you, or if you have general questions about entrepreneurship, take, your, take a piece of paper, write down your question, put your name, uh, put your name there, uh, and write down your question. And uh, someone will collect them from you during the lunch break. And after lunch, uh, no, we will sort through those questions and answer those questions. Because that may be a more efficient way of uh, addressing your questions rather than you know, uh, ask you to ask them in uh, in the forum like this. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. We'll be talking to you throughout uh, the day again, Professor Collier. Now, can you all hear me? Sorry, I just woke you up. Sorry. Technology. Technology is a great thing. We're going to talk. We'll talk a little bit about technology and its role in business model. Uh, innovation and some of the things that are going on with business models. Um, um, how many of you have a business idea who are here today? How many cities? Hopefully. So even if you don't, what I'd like you to do is on a piece of paper, write your idea on the top of the page. Just write down what your idea is. And I'm going to ask you another question. Once you write it down, it shouldn't be too hard to write it down, right? One idea. Then what I want you to do, yeah? We are connected, all right. <laughs> we can put a man on the moon. Um, so uh, write it down on the top, and then what I'd like you to do is right next to it, I'd like you to put down what industry do you think your business is in? Which industry? And we'll I'll talk to you a little bit about industry in a second. What industry do you think your business is in? Thank you very much. All right, so why is that important? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, when I ask a question, if you wanna yell out an answer, raise your hand, please, we'll do that, because I think it's much more fun for me than it is, I mean, I don't wanna talk for two or three hours, I'll get tired. Um, I can do it, though, I, I threaten you, I can do it, if you force me to. But I'll ask, so why is the industry important? You write down your business idea, and then what, why is it important for your industry? What do you think? Someone. What's that? Oh, so you might want to know who your competitors are. Sure. Absolutely. Why else might you want to know what your industry is? What's that? First mover advantage. We, I have a whole lecture on. There's no such thing. But we'll think, think about it. We'll think about it. There isn't. Well, my colleague, Professor Fernando Suarez, wrote a paper on first mover disadvantages. Disadvantages. 
Do you know Burger King? Does anyone know Burger King? Do you know McDonald's? Who moves first? They have an advantage. What, is, what would you call Burger King? Fast follower. They don't spend nearly the money McDonald's spends in R&D. They sit back, have a little leaf maybe, waiting. They watch McDonald's try 24-hour breakfast. Oh, that didn't work. We're not going to do that one. Right? Fast followers. They let their competition do all the work, spend all the money. They come in quickly behind with a slightly deviated variation of the same thing. Right? That's part of their business model. The, in the industry is extraordinarily important because of a lot, a couple things. The most important reason we want to know what industry we're in is because we want to know what the profit we should expect to generate from our business will be. So if you go into a grocery store, what kind of profit do you think you're going to get if you're in the grocery industry? In the US, I can tell you, I don't know about here, but in the US, if you go into a grocery store business, on average, the grocery store will generate return on assets of about 3%, maybe 2%. If I go into software services company, which many of us love, this is my career, I came out of software services industry. Well, the return on, well, we would probably use return on equity as our finance measure for this, maybe. I like to use return on invested capital, but for all you engineers, you're going, what the hell is that? I mean, you know, right? return on sales, return on equity, return on assets are kind of easy measures for us. Uh, return on invested capital takes away how we deal with money, the financing piece whether I take loans or whether I get equity from somewhere else. And in software services, you should be able to get 25%, 20, 25% return on equity. If I'm in the pharmaceutical industry, I should be getting 20, 25%. But we have problems in the pharmaceutical industry because in that business, in that industry, we're facing lots of competition. Generics are happening and we need, just like Bollywood, blockbuster hits. <laughs> and if I don't have a blockbuster hit, I can't make money in the industry. And I rely on that in pharmaceuticals. I rely on that in entertainment. I rely on that in gaming systems, right? So these are the things you need to know when you're entering an industry. What do you expect to get on average from that industry? What are the competition doing? And if you're looking at competitors and they're getting, you know, in the airline industry, if you can break even, you're lucky. And so we have tons of firms going into the airline business thinking they're going to make a lot of money. We're going to have a lot of profits and they fail. But we should expect them to fail because the return on, ass the return on probably assets in that industry is pretty low. Why do they think they're going to get 10%? Why do they think they'll get more than that? Innovation can help us figure out how we might be able to do better than the average return on an industry. The business model is probably more likely to tell us how we're going to do better on average than the industry. And technology has a little bit of influence on both of those, right? But not exclusive. And in fact, we'll talk about a couple of different examples where technology has a role. I mean, technology has a role in everything we're doing nowadays. But it, if you're in, you know, many of you are in the, in the MBA program, may not have a deep um, knowledge in kind of the technology arena, you don't really need it. You can always buy it. You know, in the US, we always say, we'll just outsource that. <laughs> well, that's us that down to India or China. I don't care whoever has all the smart, smart guys, right? Because we care about making money. And business models is about making money. Don't kid yourself, all right? So we're going to talk about a few things today. We're going to talk about some terms and technology, some terms and a little bit about technology, just to kind of get your minds in a place, a common place. I'm going to define at least from my perspective, some of the terms that we use, I think sometimes that are used interchangeably in entrepreneurship and innovation that aren't interchangeable. Um, then we'll talk about venture strategy and a business model framework kind of to give us a position. Uh, I use my colleague, Mark Meyer, Professor Meyer, who's from Northeastern University. He's helped contribute to the ITE uh, New Idea Program. Uh, he's uh, a well-known author in 
product platform strategies and has done uh, a lot of work in business model design and innovation. Many of you probably know the Lean Canvas. Lean Canvas, anyone? I thought, you, no. If you ever go to California and you don't know what the Lean Canvas is, they'll throw you out. So uh, do a little research, especially if you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> don't use it. Use Mark Myers, Professor Myers' uh, business model framework. We'll look at it a little bit today. Uh, but there are other models that we can use. So we'll, we'll talk briefly about that. Then we're going to start to dive into how do we find drivers for innovation. We have revenue drivers and we have cost drivers, and they're in the industry. We've got to go look for them because that's where our opportunities are going to be found. In fact, if you start with a product and you're looking for some industry or some place to go sell it, good luck. Chris won't invest in you. Right? But if you look at the industry and you start to understand the problems that are being created inside that industry, and if you're looking at the gaps that the current sets of solutions aren't filling in the industry, then you're more likely, if you're speaking that language, which is business model language, to get an angel investor or a venture capitalist to invest in your business. All right? So we'll look at kind of how do we do that. And if we have enough time, hopefully we'll have enough time, uh, I'll take a layer deeper and show you kind of how we might do that. So we'll do some what I call subsystem analysis, looking at Uber. I think you guys more or less know what Uber is, right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, we might look at Netflix on how do we transform an industry. And many of you may have heard a bit about Netflix. We'll go into the Wayback Machine and we'll look at Netflix when it was taking on Blockbuster in the US when we were just renting videos and DVDs, right? not on the streaming stuff, but the streaming stuff has everything to do with how they started, right? Everything to do with how they started. So that's what we're going to do. Um, briefly, my background. I'm a, I'm a technologist. I'm a nerd, just like a lot of people in the room. I study computer science, electrical engineering. But what I really figured out why I was was a systems engineer. And we can be systems engineers. We don't have to study engineering. Systems engineers is really dealing with complexity ambiguity, the, the, the ability to do this, and we learn that in our MBA programs, and we learn that in our engineering programs. How do we look at problems and break them down systematically and put them back together in varying different ways, right? And you should be learning that with your business school program. You should be learning that with your engineering programs. And problem solving is what an entrepreneur does best. They look at problems in very new and different ways. And Think of solutions generally with existing technologies. And re we recombine these technologies in ways that haven't been done before, and that gives us the advantage. And it's the business model that we wrap around it that helps us make money and defend our positions in the industry that we pick. All right, so that's what we're going to be thinking about today. So hopefully we'll get through all this stuff. We've been slow. Every, you know, This is India. I'm learning. Every country I go to, we have a different time. Not time zone, just different time. Time is not a constant. Um, anyway. So some commonly misused terms, I think. So I'm going to give you my definitions. Entrepreneurship. Believe it or not, I don't use the word entrepreneurship when it comes to start up. A lot of people interchange entrepreneur with startup. An entrepreneur is a business person. Entrepreneurship has been around for thousands, hundreds of years, thousands of years. It's just the exchange of goods and services for something of value. An entrepreneur, that's what we do. Typically a business person, that's the interchangeable word, business person, entrepreneur. It's not an innovator, it's not an inventor, it's, not, it's, it's just the business person. And so we have new ventures, and so we typically assign the term entrepreneurship to new ventures and entrepreneurship to existing corporations, they're really all doing the same thing, providing exchange of goods or services for something of value, right? That's what we do. And it's how we're looking at solving problems that creates, that provides that creative entrepreneur who's actually gonna be successful. Because an entrepreneur, some, a business person, only exists if they can generate profit over the long term and create some form of sustainable advantage, right? That's what we're trying to do. And so our innovation work and our invention is really helping feed that competitive advantage. 
so that we can sell our good or service at value in the marketplace. Okay? Incubation. Incubation is just a process. That's all it is. An accelerator and an incubator. Incubator is kind of slower than an accelerator, right? If you step on the gas, it's like an incubator on steroids, right? And there has to be some formal process that you go through if you're going to be incubating, just like it sounds like, right? We think of incubation with, you know, eggs or whatever, you know, they start at the beginning as some shape and then after we apply a few things and techniques to it and we wait for some amount of time, something comes out the other end. It may or may not look like what it started, right? Caterpillars and whatever. But there's a formal process and there's a repeatable process and if we know how to do it well enough, then hopefully when we, what we start with and what we end with can be expected. And the incubation process isn't something, you know, I, we have the, the idea here uh, when Chris was talking to I2E, we have this stage gate review and I will tell you, I've looked at thousands of ideas, I've, looked at, I've talked to tons of startups and I cannot tell you which one will be a winner. And I've looked at thousands of them. I can tell you who's ready to move to the next step, maybe, but I can't tell you which one's going to be the next unicorn out there, the next big successful venture. You guys will be able to do it with your business because you believe in it, you trust in it, you, know, you believe in yourself, and you're going to make it happen no matter what anyone tells you, right? You can go through the stage gate and someone says, nah, I don't think that's a good idea. You may say, I do. And you just keep pushing. The, these are some of those attributes of entrepreneurship, kind of the, the drive to succeed that you have to have uh, regardless of what anyone else is going to tell you. But the process needs to be in place. There has to be some formalized process and we've kind of articulated it in our own new idea model where we, we start at the beginning which is market analysis and understanding kinds of what's going on. Then we spend a little bit of time in the middle on solution design, the product piece, very little bit of time. And then we spend a lot of time on the back end trying to get to the customers and sell and who's going to buy and what kind of price and all those kind of things that happen, right? So you got front end, that's all marketing. Back end, that's all sales. And in the middle, we've got some product design going on. Right? So we need business people and we need product design people and we need people who know how to make teams happen and we need leadership and we need all these kind of skills in order for this to happen. But it's an incubation, it's a formalized process that we have to go through. And we think we can take you through that uh, clearly with the I2E program and we've been doing it very well at Northeastern for quite a few years now. Innovation then is just a new, different, better way to solve a problem. Innovation is not entrepreneurship. We have invention. Oh, we, we came up with some idea. It's great, wonderful, or who knows. But it, invention doesn't solve any problems. Innovation, we start to apply that invention to a problem. And hopefully it's better than, than it was before. But it's not till we start to go to market, we start to sell through some entrepreneurial model, whether it's a new venture or an existing firm, that that idea, that innovation can start to generate cash for the owners, right? So they're really different terms, so don't confuse them. They're, not, they're really not the same thing. Innovation, we can see technology innovation or product innovation or business model innovation. We see these, these things happening Innovation can happen with inside of all these processes, right? And in fact, my view is that, I don't know, where's the little laser bar? Is that that guy, this one? This one, no. I don't know where it is. There it is, there it is, all right. Now I, I can shoot at you guys too, all right. <laughs> right, so innovation can be applied to products, innovation can be applied to process, the solutions that the problems that we're solving hopefully we can take to market as and become successful entrepreneurs with the businesses we create i think you should be really clear about the distinction between these things all right technology let's talk just briefly about technology i love technology i i owned a newton does anyone ever does anyone know what a newton is, is anyone old enough newton apple's first handheld device was called a newton one of the biggest disasters ever 
And I thought, what a great idea this thing is. I bought two of them. You know, it was a, we, we call them at the bleeding edge of technology. I was a bleeder. And I would buy all this crap. And Newton was a handheld device uh, you could write on it. It, it had uh, handwriting recognition capabilities, right? And uh, it was a mess. It was a mess. It didn't work. But I was in business at the time, and I had an idea. I thought, if I could, if, if I was in negotiations, I was negotiating joint ventures all around Asia Pacific, and I thought, if I could communicate with the guy who's sitting next to me while we're in a meeting negotiating, and my colleagues can't, my competitors across the table can't, I might have an advantage. So the only thing I used this device for, the Newton for, was a buddy of mine and I configured it so we could wire, uh, I think it was, it was, uh, I can't think of the, the technology, but we could talk to each other in the room and nobody knew we were talking to each other and it was kind of cool. And we would win deals occasionally because we were a little bit ahead of our competition, right? But other than that was a mess. So let's look at these. How many of you own something like this? Huh? Anyone own one of the iPhones? Only two people in the room. I don't believe it. iPhones, Samsung, I don't know. Samsung, how many of you own Samsung now? Yeah, this is interesting. I, I bet about a few years ago, no one owned Samsung, right? Samsung, right? <laughs> Why is that? What, what is Apple known for? What's their business model known for? Innovation. innovation. What's the problem if you lead with innovation as your business model? What do you have to do? Innovate better than your competition. And when you stop innovating better than your competition, what happens? You lose, they win. It's an all or nothing game. Here comes Samsung, right? Here comes Samsung. I mean, I, Apple's done some other cool stuff to kind of protect their space and can, can retain that competitive advantage. But, uh, you know, it's in trouble. But this is an interesting thing. We're in this age of technology. Everything we do nowadays is we've moved from, what is this, 1500s? God, we invented a boat back then or something. And now we're up here in the 2000s. And technology innovation is just hitting us constantly, right? But and this is an older iPhone. This iPhone has got some technology inside of it. How much was invented by Apple? Most of it? How about none of it? All right, the phone was not invented by Apple. The phone was invented by some old guy in the US. I think he was in the US when he invented it. That first call came from Boston, or from Massachusetts, actually. And um, golden age, so he was an inventor. We didn't have innovators, and we didn't have entrepreneurs back then. We had inventors. And inventors invented something, and they tried to make, make it go. And it was a golden age. For a long time, we relied on inventors to produce product, goods and services that we were going to buy in the market and create some value. Entrepreneurs, right? Lone wolves, individuals who would do this stuff. And then, from 1930s to 1980s, large corporations with deep pockets and lots of money invested tons and tons of money in research and development projects and initiatives. And out of these initiatives, AT&T Bell Labs created this picture phone, and they had lots of other technology that went on during that time. Well, you know, big companies like to do what? They like to sell you what they want to sell you, not what you want, <laughs> right? They don't change their product because it costs too much, right? And they like selling what they already have. We'll talk about this in a minute. Sustaining innovation, it's the stuff that they think you want, but they don't want to change because it will cost them too much to change and they'll lose money. And I don't want to lose money, I want to make money, right? And so the consumers are sitting there going, yeah, God, this thing, ugh, ugh, oh, Samsung, yay, right? <laughs> so big companies were doing this, and it was a great thing for a long time, but then, you know, some hairy, long-haired hippies <laughs> who just think, man, let's just do something different, we don't care if we make money, right? They just sit back and say, we're smart, we think we have some ideas, let's start to plug some things together. And so what... What's happening today with technology is we're looking at technology 
And this is the entrepreneur now, right? This is our enthusiast. We want to change the world and we want to do things in new and different ways. And so these two guys got together and they started to muck around in the labs, right? Muck around, see what they can make in their garage, you know? If you, if you haven't made it in your garage, you're not cool. I, I don't know, I don't have a garage, so I guess I won't be cool. But this is what's going on today, is we have these teams of smart individuals who have a broad range of knowledge about existing technologies and we're recombining them in a lot of really cool in different ways, right? And then we put a business model around these ways we recombine technologies in order to make money. And so if I'm an entrepreneur today, and you're thinking, if you're sitting in there, and I know there are a bunch of business uh, MBA students in the, in the room, and you're going, well, I don't know anything about technology. I'm a business dude, right? Don't worry about it. Most, as you look at the process, front end, marketing, back end, sales, middle, some technology, right? So you really need to think about how can you find this, and how do you think creatively? Do you know that there's some research that's been done on scientists who have started businesses? The most successful scientists who have started businesses have started businesses, even if they were in a scientific field, not in their field of study. Why would that be? I have deep domain knowledge. I've spent thousands of years studying biomolecular bio -molecular cell growth, and now I'm over in some other area of, of, of science. Entrepreneurs need to have open minds. They need to be able to demonstrate how they can work with others and accept new information in order to recombine this in different new ways. So if you're st stuck deep down in this technology, you're not going to be open for the kind of changes you might have to make in order to, to go to market successfully. Right, so here's the stuff, right? Inside of this silly thing that everyone's addicted to, right, we got Unicor 1960s, G the GUIs in the 50s and 60s, Digital camera in the 80s, Kodak, we don't even want to get into what Kodak did, right? Does anyone know what Kodak did? They gave it away. <laughs> we invented digital. Do you know how it was presented to the CEO? So the engineers, brilliant people, presented the digital camera to the CEOs and said, this is the new world, and we're going to call it, quote, unquote, filmless photography. What is Kodak? What was Kodak? They don't exist anymore. They were a film company. So if you say to the CEO of a film company, we have a great idea, it's called filmless photography. Oops, I just missed the market. They said, who's gonna want filmless photography? Plus, that's who we are, right? They missed, right? Digital camera, 1980s, integrated circuit, 1960s, lithium battery, 1960s, wireless switching networks, 1940s. This technology has been around for a long, long time. Look at any major lab, there's technology sitting in these labs waiting for you guys to reconfigure them, recombine them in some way that can make money. So this is what you need to be thinking about is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And then you can find something from a technology perspective that can help you solve it, but don't, you don't have to focus on it. That's right, so the next thing I want to touch on is what's a business model. And I'm gonna use a, a, a venture development framework that Professor Myers put together does anyone, I'm sorry, before we go, technology. Are you guys scared of technology or not? Don't be scared anymore. It's not a scary thing. Recombining it is kind of fun. And sometimes you wonder if, you're, if it really exists or not. But, um, you, you know, you're probably sitting next to somebody who knows something that can help you out. All right. Business models. So we, we have two things, that are three things really that I want to kind of touch on. We have of business venture strategy. What is the strategy of the firm? Do we care all this business? What, do we care if we have a strategy? Do you have, if so for, if you write down, if, what I'd like you to do is write down on the top of your page that you got about your business, I want you to write down in one sentence, one sentence, what is your strategy? I, I, and I guarantee you if you can't do it in one sentence, you don't know what you're doing. One sentence, just write, take, take, I'll give you a minute. One sentence, write down. What is your business's strategy? No, you don't have business. I'm watching. I'm going to collect these at the end and I'm going to grade you all. No, I'm not. 
I'm not allowed to make jokes. Sorry. So if you can't do it, let me give you a little tip. All right? I'll, I'm going to call it a statement of strategic intent. My statement of strategic intent should include three things. What is my product? Who are my target customers? And what is my value proposition? Does, it, does Ikea live here? Do you guys know what who Ikea is? It is opening. Ikea is like an awesome wonderland of furniture frenzy. It's, I, can't, I can only imagine how it's going to play out here in India. It'll be, it'll be lots of fun. Uh, Southwest Airline, airline eh, I'm trying to think. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know too many Indian company examples. Next time I come, I'll do some research on them and I'll, I'll talk about them. IKEA is an interesting company, though. They have uh, furniture, and it's, it's really kind of you go to the store and you don't, you don't order anything. You go there and you pick it up and you take it home. And it's in a box and you've got to put it together. What a nightmare. I mean, who the heck would want that? I don't want it, but someone does, right? Who wants it? You guys want it, actually. It's for young professionals. Young professionals who don't want to spend a lot of money on furniture, right? But they want something that looks good and it has some kind of design concept to it, right? So IKEA's strategy or their statement of strategic intent is we, we offer furniture with high design at low cost for young furniture buyers or young professionals. Product, value proposition, high design at low cost, target customer, young professionals. Right? You should be able to say something that simple about your business. So if you, if you can't, you don't know enough about your business. I, I like to say if you explain your business to your grandmother, if she's still with us, right? and if she can understand you, you've probably done the right amount of work. If she can't understand you, go back and try again, all right? So we need to know what our strategy is. It's important to know, and I'm going to give you a little quick tool to use about strategy, at least simple. Uh, you guys are all MBAs, so you should know strategy better than I do. I teach strategy, so just have uh, that. Customer value proposition. I'm going to give you, uh, I want to give you a quick, a quick idea on how to think about a value proposition. You'll see thousands of them. Everyone talks about value propositions. They're all wrong. No. Value propositions can be two, of two kinds. And I think it's important for you to know, because your value proposition should reinforce your strategy. Right? So one type of value proposition is what we'll call quantifiable. And I'll give you an easy example. Quantifiable. If I give you, if you give me $15,000, and I give you back $30,000, would you, would you take it? If, if you give me 15 and I give you back 30, is that a good deal? Would you, would you take it? Yeah, who would take the deal? Everybody should take the deal. Come on, every, everyone's hand. Oh, please up. Okay, stand. I think the blood's not flowing to your brains because this is like the easiest question I've ever asked. If I give you 15, if you give me $15,000 and I give you 30,000 back, you should take the deal and run away, All right? <laughs> That's what your value proposition, quantifiable value proposition, should be that clear to your consumer. If you buy my product or service which solves your problem in this particular kind of way, and you spend so, this much money with me for it, by applying that, whatever problems you're solving, you're going to have some benefit that's hopefully greater than the amount you're spending, quantifiable. And I would argue that every business should be able to define the quantifiable benefit of their business. And if you can't, you don't know enough about the industry you're selling into. And go learn more. I have a, I have a women's handbag business. Women's handbag. I also have a french fry restaurant. I don't know why. Why do I do this, right? Women's handbag. I know a lot about women's handbags. I didn't know very much when I started, but when I started, as I started to do research, there were things, some things that were interesting, like 
How many bags does an average woman in the U.S. own? Any guess? Throw it out there. Ten. Ten. Actually, they own ten. Have you, you, you know way too much. Hmm. <laughs> Sisters? No, I don't know. Ten, they, they actually have ten bags. On average, they own ten bags in the U.S. How many of those bags are worth more than U.S. $2,000? Two. So on average, two bags are what I'll call pretty expensive, right? I mean, 2,000 bucks for a freaking bag, you just throw stuff in. But if it matches my shoes, <laughs> right? <laughs> but what I did find out, so we, you know, we found out all this data, but we found out that there was no vinyl. We call it vegan. vegan we have vegan leather handbags, right? Vinyl handbags at the $200 to $250 price point. And oh, by the way, vegan is a huge trend in the industry. Young women in the United States are like turning into, well, Indians, I guess. They love veg. They won't eat meat, right? They want vinyl. They don't want leather. They don't want to wear leather. They don't want to own leather. They don't want to touch leather. They don't want pets. They don't want, they don't want what they want. But they want vinyl. But there was no there was no product in the market, high-end vinyl handbag, in that $200, $250 U.S. range. Well, now there is, and that's our business. You have to know what's going on in the business. That's why you need to understand the industry. You have to dive into it and understand what's going on with the consumers and how do you satisfy the gap in that market. Quantifiable. I can quantify the benefit. Second type of solution is pretty much all consumer products. I'll call them aspirational value proposition, right? I love shoes. I love Johnson & Murphy shoes. They're like $300 or more, right? Or if you like fast cars, Ferraris, you know, whatever. I don't know what, Tesla is another. I call Tesla aspirational. Who needs a $10,000 purse? Does anyone need a $10,000 purse? Nobody needs it, right? You don't need it. And if I don't need it, then I can't quantify the benefit, right? And so if you're in a consumer space and you're trying to sell and you're building this business around a consumer product, well, you can go one of two ways. You can go cheap and your value proposition is basically, I'm cheaper than that one, buy it. And then, and then I'll go, yeah, I'll buy that. Or if you want to create value, aspirational, then you have, to, you have to aspire to some image or vision. That's why you have the Gucci man or the Gucci woman. I want to be like him or her. I want to live his or her life. I want to, I mean, this is like all perfumes, right? J'adore, right? And you'll be the most attractive person in the room, right? But if you're going to do an aspirational value proposition, what do you need to do in your business model? This is an open question to the audience. What do you need to do? Anyone in marketing? Raise your hand, marketing people. Any, no marketing? No one's, MBA? No one's studying mark, studying? Okay, then you have to go back and take your class. If I'm an aspirational value proposition, the only thing I can do in my business model is spend a lot of money in marketing. A lot of money in marketing because that's the only way you can attract and gain attention by your target audience, right? So value propositions. So strategy, value propositions are tightly connected. And then we get to the business model. I'm gonna talk in some detail about the components of the business model. Uh, let's see, I, I, this clock has, I have 107. So where do we wanna to go to? We have some time after. We have some extra time after so I can, while we're on 130, awesome, awesome. All right, so then, the, the, then we get into the business model. So strategy is separate. We think about our venture strategy first because the decisions we need to make in our business model should reinforce the strategy we want to have. Let me give you an example. So have you guys seen Porter's, you business MBA people, Porter's generic positioning strategies? Yes, few of you. Okay, so this is a really important tool. It's a simple tool. Simple because as all strategists love, we love two by twos, right? If it's a two by two, 
We can make a lot of money. If it's, a two, if it's got that extra dimension deep, people get confused and their brains blow up. So we have to only explain things in two by two models. And what this tells us is we have four generic strategic positions that we can be in. If you're an entrepreneur, if, well, so let me just explain them briefly. Top right, we have industry-wide. So if you define your industry, every segment in the industry, so if I'm automobile, I've got compact cars, I've got mid-range cars, I've got luxury sedans, I've got electric vehicles. So I have this industry has all these different segments in it. Same with hotels. We have budget hotels or family hotels or luxury hotels, right? Segments, all the segments. So the top is what we call broad market. I'm in all or many segments. The bottom is I'm in one or few. I only pick one or few segments. On the right, I'm a cost leader. Cost leader means the sum of all the activities I perform to do my business, the sum of the cost of those is less than my competition. It doesn't mean I can't spend more money in one area or not, but the sum of the costs. And if I'm in the top left, or if I'm on the left side, this is, I've increased, we call it differentiation. I like to call it willingness to pay. The customers are willing to pay more for your goods or service for some reason. Whatever that reason is. More features, more brand building, who knows what, right? And so as a venture strategy, you need to pick where, am I, where do I want to play in this market? And your industry analysis is going to determine how competitive each of these segments are. Right? And you don't necessarily want to jump into a segment that's super competitive because uh, it's going to be hard to win. Or unless you can go into that space and figure out with your business model what activities you should combine that can create that long-term strategic advantage that you hope to gain. Where would most new ventures enter in on this grid? So where would they enter in in these four? Any votes for here? No, no votes? Oh, well, <laughs> the other was. He put his hand down really fast, so after you said no, he was like, wait. Pretty tough to come in here. How about over here? Low cost, or cost leader, broad market? How many think? Any votes for this one? Pretty hard, yeah, a couple. This would be hard also. Most of them are gonna come in in either a focused strategy, Oop. Focus strategy either as a value differentiator, increasing willingness to pay, or as a low cost provider in the segment. So it's mo because normally, in order for a new venture to be successful, you have to be focused on an initial segment. It doesn't mean your overall strategy might not be to rule the world, but when you're coming in, you have to win in a specific segment. Target, solve the problem, right? And so one or the other. One word of caution, especially when we get to technology, right? A lot of times, I hear people come to me and they say, I have this great idea. I have this totally new way with this cool technology that I've invented that solves this problem better than any current solution. It's like 10 times better. And the current cost of this in the market, the current price consumers are willing to spend is, let's say, 100 rupees, 1,000 rupees, whatever. Let's say 1,000 rupees. I want to sell for 900 rupees. I'm like, why would you want to do that? Because my technology, the cost, I, I got eliminated all these costs that my competition has. And I can deliver it for $900. Even if my costs are way cheaper, so I can, I'm just going to price it lower. But if I'm creating so much value with this new technology, you potentially can price that higher. Because there's more value get, being gained by the consumer. If it's 10 times better. Don't give up on price too early. And a lot of times it's like, well, nobody knows who I am. I'm brand new. How am I going to enter this market if nobody knows me? Uh, don't do it by dropping your price. You need to be very careful. Very careful. All right. So this would be our strategic generic positions. And then we're going to have to pick a bunch of activities. If we pick a narrow differentiator, then what are the activities I have to perform to support that strategy? Right? If I'm a cost leader, if I want to be a cost leader, what are the activities that I'm going to have to perform to support that position? Southwest Airlines, a very famous US 
regional air carrier. And the marketing director came to the CEO and he said, she said, uh, we've done some market research. We found this really great low cost chicken salad sandwich that we'd love to put on our plane and off our customers. We've done market research. The customer love it. It's a great price. What did he do? What do you think he did? What's that? Increase the price? No. Go. Yell it. Yell it at me. I'm old. I can't. Yeah. He didn't do it. He, he fired her. He fired her on the spot. We are a cost leader. The sum of our activities need to be lower than our competition. Do you know how expensive it is to put food on an airplane? It doesn't matter how much it costs. The product costs. All of the support resources, everything else you need to do to put food on an airplane costs a lot of money. That's why these airplanes, these low cost carriers, they don't do it. Or if they do do it, they're going to charge you for it. But they don't really want to do it because they have to add all these kind of other services to do it. He fired her on the spot because she's his direct report, the CEO. She reports to the CEO. And he said, can you imagine the decisions your team is making? You sit with me every day and you don't understand the message. I, only, I have no idea what your team is doing then. They're making decisions that aren't in line with my strategy. Right? It's really important to keep that in mind. So strategy should drive every decision and every choice that you're making. So now we're getting down to the business model. Business model are those choices that we're making. It's the choices that we're going to make to support the strategy. And we can make different choices to support the strategy. Some are good and some are bad. We want to make the choices that help us decide how do we make money doing what we do? How do we make money doing what we do? And what are the resources then we need to have in place in order to make the money. So how do we build the resources to drive the business and, and to support the strategy that we have? And so we have some key pieces in the business model, Meyer framework. We have our revenue model. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the revenue model today's lecture because I'm going to talk a little bit more about how do we drive, uh, kind of how, do, how, do, how do we look at cost and revenue drivers, which tends to be done in the operating side. But our revenue model includes things like our price, includes things like velocity, how fast does it, does it turn over, how many do we sell, who's our customer, who's going to buy. There's a whole bunch of questions around the revenue model that we have to solve. I'm going to take a quick break. How much money have we spent so far? This is a lot of work, right? Have we talked about a lot of work? How much money have we spent as a venture so far? Zero. Hopefully, we have a team of people who are trying to answer a bunch of really important questions. Now, we might do some things. We, we might get to a point where we can't, we don't know even the questions to ask yet. I have, I have a French fry restaurant. Yes, I do. It's one of the best restaurants in Boston, top, top restaurants in Boston. When my team started, there were some students who, we st who started, they came to me with an idea, and so we started to look at it. And none of them have a restaurant background. None of them are chefs. None of them know anything about food. They know nothing. They were all business, they were all, uh, business students. Some in marketing, some in, I think, supply chain. And so I said, OK, if you really want to get into the restaurant business, and they gave me the reasons why. They did the market research. There was no food product category in this space. Uh, the quick service food industry is the fastest growing food service industry in the world, uh, growing at about 8 to 10 percent. Uh, large scale kind of sit down dining experiences are, are, are struggling to make money. Uh, so they had done the work, but they didn't know anything about it. I said, come back to me in a year. Go work in your competitors' restaurants and learn about the industry and come back and then let's talk about it. And they did. So this may be some of the things that you have to start to think about if you're, gonna, if you're going to start or launch your own business and be profitable. Souse, which is the, the restaurant that we have, is very successful. We're opening a couple of extra new stores hopefully this year. Um, but it takes that kind of commitment. You have to go, you have to kind of go do the work. When we did market research, we used to stand outside of our, well actually we stood inside of our customer's restaurant also for a year. And we were looking at What's the volume on Monday afternoon from 2 to 3 in January? 
what's the volume on Monday afternoon from 2 to 3 in October? So we could estimate the volatility of demand, a cost driver, right? You have to know the cost drivers of your industry. So we spent a lot of time in the operational model, product development, what's your product, how do you do it, how do you get your product out, how is it going to be produced, how are you going to fulfill your demand, and then most products need some service, right? How are you going to fix it? What happens if it breaks? What if nobody likes it? How are they going to order it? How are you going to deliver all that? Are you going to do it or is someone else going to do it? It's all part of your operational model. And then once we're all done figuring out what our revenue model looks like and what our operating model looks like, we have to figure out how much money we need to raise. So at some point in time after we figure all this other stuff out, we need to say, well, I got to develop a product and I got to get a partnership with a distributor and I got to hire a bunch of people and you know, I may have to invent something, I don't know, right? Okay, so I need some R&D people. You start to put a budget together, that's your upfront costs for building a business. And that could be a year or two away from where you are today. Guess what? During that year or two, you're also selling your product or service to your consumer base. So my first company was a uh, social network company uh, we started about the same time LinkedIn. LinkedIn is actually done wrong, but their business model is great and they lived and I sold to Google. Yes, it was successful. But we had the, the problems back then were I had to sell this idea of social networking. We were a business social networking product, not a consumer uh, a networking market like we see with LinkedIn or Facebook. We were internal business solution. And these, you know, so I would go sell my product to companies like Honeywell and Fidelity and some other large firms. And I had to, you know, for anyone software, software engineers in here, yeah, have you ever developed Vapor? Yeah, I have. Um, you know, you're going and providing this vision of what the software, what your solution might look like, and you want to get money. You want to get commitments from your customer even before you have a product built, if you can. It validates your design, it validates your initiatives. You'll learn through that process what they want and what they don't want. So when I started, I had this big, ugly beast of a, of, of a process, and when we got done, there was just a little kernel that was left, but it created a tremendous amount of value for the buyers. So revenue model, how do we get paid? What's our mechanisms and frequency and so on? Operating, how are we gonna support the revenue that we're gonna generate? What are the services that we need and how, how are we going to fulfill demand? And then what's the, what's the cost to put all that together? That's our, that's our business model. So how do we find drivers of innovation? I'm going to talk about these. I think I can do this in enough time that we can break. Eh, close. Um, that we can look at. So a lot of times we, we, we have to think about the difference between what is innovation and what is operational excellence because we want to focus on innovation. Don't focus on doing the same thing as your competition. Operational excellence, we do the same thing as our competition, we're just better at them than they are at doing it. Toyota, for a long time, is operational excellence. No strategy, but hugely operationally excellent. Innovation is when we look at new ways of providing products or services, and new and different ways to our consumers, and that's where we need to focus. All right. In order to do that, we have to look at, once we define our strategy, are we going to be a cost leader or a differentiator? Are we going to try and drive through price, or are we going to try, and, through price, or are we going to try to drive through cost? How do we look at, in one bucket, which costs should be re reduced or eliminated? Or if we have another strategy, how do we look at those pieces that needed to be potentially spent and increased? What are the revenue drivers or the cost drivers, depending on our strategy? Let's see, I went the wrong way. All right. Why don't we do this? I think we're at a good place where we can stop. And then you guys can get energized. What I'd like you to do is um, think, think a little bit about your business. Think about the industry you're in and write down on your paper one or two what do you think the most, what are the biggest cost elements that impact the business you're in and the industry you're in? 
right? So if I'm, uh, if I'm in the airline industry, do you know what the most, what, what's the biggest amount of uh, money an airline spends, single line item that an airline spends in their business, do you know? What, what's that? Okay, let's, let me rephrase it. I'm, you're answering it very, very properly and I did a bad job. When you define your industry, define it as narrowly as possible. So what, I, what I'm actually saying is, when I'm a, if I'm an air, if I'm a, like an air carrier, I, just, I don't build airplanes, I use airplanes to ship people from A to B. So passenger airlines. What's that? Infrastructure. Fuel. Fuel represents anywhere from 35 to 50 percent of their total cost, right? So nothing else kind of matters. So they spend a lot of their time on fuel arbitrage. I mean, how, do, I, do I buy early or do I, how do I bet on fuel prices? But we'll talk about fuel uh, industries or the airline industry in a second. What I want you to do, one or two key cost drivers. What's the most important cost? A restaurant industry, labor costs are 32 percent of the cost of a restaurant. Food costs are about 31 percent. If I look at labor costs, what's the most expensive labor component of a restaurant? Chef, right? My restaurant, we don't have a chef. Boom, right? One way to get rid of costs. So I want you to think about what's your primary cost driver in your business. We'll chat a little bit after this. And I don't know where we're having lunch. We'll have someone take care of us. All right. We'll chat after lunch. Thank you, sir. Now I request all the dignitaries to join for lunch.